and Daniel chapter 9 tonight, if you will, please. And I begin reading in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince, they shall come, uh, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolation are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Well, <clears throat> many books have been writ written about this, about what the weeks are, what the days are, and all the rest. But they leave out the story of the Messiah that's in here, which is what it's all about. And so tonight we're going to see the story <clears throat> of our Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Point number one in verse 24, he says to finish the transgression. So let's for a moment think about transgression being finished. First of all, transgression is apostatize. It is rebellion. You can see this in Ezekiel 28, 15, or in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 7, where we see the fall of man, a sin entering into the human race, all apostatizing, rebelling against Almighty God. And, and that's an important story for sinners to hear, that they're guilty, that sin of Adam has been imputed to the whole human race, Romans 5, 12. But let's don't leave out the word finished, because it's vitally important. It literally means, <clears throat> and I like this, to restrain, to shut it up, to prohibit it from affecting any judgment or punishment. I really like that. The transgression is finished. The imputed sin is finished for his people. It cannot bring judgment or punishment upon them. And then we look at the next word that comes along of importance to us tonight, and that is the word reconciliation because of or for iniquity. Now, <clears throat> The scripture says very clearly, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And um, so the sentence of iniquity is death. God has so demanded it. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's four times in the scriptures, Old and New Testament. Very important in the gospel story that God is going to hold each one accountable for who they are and what they've done, etc. And uh, but he says that there is reconciliation because of. Now God has demanded 
iniquity be punished. God has demanded the soul that sent it, it shall die. And so reconciliation is made in the place of, for, in the stead of those people. Reconciliation literally means to expiate, to atone, to pardon or purge. And this has to be by blood. All the way through the scripture, blood shed to show death. You can see that in Hebrews 9.22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so this reconciliation because of the iniquity, the stand-in because of our sin, is Jesus Christ. And he expiates, or he atones, or he pardons, or he purges uh, all of his people from their sin. So totally purged, so totally pardoned, that it remains no more. Not only does it remain no more, but God says, he remembers it no more. If you know Christ tonight, God does not remember that iniquitous past. Tis gone. Tis pardoned. Tis purged. Tis expiated entirely by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. The next, then, he says, and I want to tie point number three in with point number one here in a moment. Everlasting righteousness. Now, I got excited about this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 51 for just a brief moment. And in Isaiah chapter 51, <clears throat> I read verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Now with that, flip over to 2 Corinthians and chapter 3. Now he talks about the ministration of the law, and he calls it the ministration of death being taken away. Verse 11, for that which is done away was glorious. Much more, that which it's written in present active indicative, it just keeps right on being, remaineth forever. His righteousness remains forever. It cannot be taken away. God has declared his righteousness is everlasting. And those overtaken by the righteousness of Christ in his saving grace shall never see death now nor ever. Yeah, we part out of this body. It's not death. That's promotion to glory. Never, never, never see death. Now since, point number one, the transgression is finished, completely, totally held back from ever affecting any judgment or punishment, and all of the acts of Adam that were impeded the whole human race for his people taken out of the way, in their place, because of reconciliation, is everlasting righteousness. Now you can see this all over the book of Hebrews. But God says to his people, everlasting righteousness. I don't know whether you got that or not, but so I'm going to take a little moment to make sure you did. Everlasting has to have always been. Is now and ever shall be. 
You were always his. He says it in the scriptures from before the foundation of the world. You were his. Sin entered into the human race, but he took care of that. That could not stop his people from being his people. Christ reconciled because of that iniquity, bought them back by his blood, and imputes to them everlasting righteousness. You can see this in Jeremiah, I believe it's uh, 1533, uh, where he says that uh, they shall say, the Lord is my righteousness. They have no righteousness of their own. It is that imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come to verse 26 for point number four in your outline tonight. And we see that Messiah shall be cut off, uh, but not for himself. Now I want to spend a little time here in Isaiah chapter 53, if you will, please. And in Isaiah chapter 53, first we're going to look at... Uh, Verse 4. Surely, now remember, we're coming from that passage that said he'll be cut off, but not for himself. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Verse 5, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes were healed. Look now at verse 6. We've all gone astray, but the Lord, that is God the Father, laid on his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our iniquity. He did not die for himself. He died for those specific people that his Father gave him from before eternity. Now look at verse 8. He was taken from prison and judgment. But look at the last phrase. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Hold right there. Point number one in your outline tonight. The transgression is finished. Imputed to Christ in our stead on the cross of Calvary. Restrained from ever bringing any judgment or punishment upon us. It's completely, totally finished by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you see in verse 8. Now verse 9. Made his grave with the wicked, etc. With the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. Totally innocent. Completely, totally innocent. He had done no wrong. I was reading someone, I believe it was yesterday, who was expounding in their brilliance, and they said that Jesus Christ was a sinner like all of us. Sorry, Charlie, that's not so. That's a lie. Absolutely perfect. Because if he was not perfect, he could not intercede for you. He could not before his father take your sin if he had his to die for. That's why it says so clearly, cut off, but not for himself. One of the most beautiful phrases, not for himself. Verse 11 now in our text, God the Father is going to see the travail of his son's soul. And he's going to be satisfied. He's satisfied with what? He's satisfied that the transgression is finished. All against it. Turn, hold your hand there to um, Colossians chapter 2. Should be, I think, verse 10. No. It's verse um, 13 and 14. You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision in your flesh, he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, 
blotting out everything that was written against you, took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. Everything written against you in the law, taken out of the way, Christ did so, so completely that your sins and your iniquities, he says, I remember no more. He sees you in adoption. He sees you, therefore, in perfection. He sees you totally acceptable to him based upon that which was performed for you. Isaiah 53, 12. <clears throat> On down in there, he said he was numbered with the transgressions, and he bare the sin of not everyone, but of those his father sent him to save. Many. That many does not and cannot include all. It is very clear that it is specifically his elect. Again, in point number four in your outline, cut off, but not for himself, John 19.30, he says it is finished, but I want you to look at Luke chapter 23 now. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, your attention please, he'd been on that cross for a long time. Now, if you know anything about human physics, you're on the cross, you can breathe in, you can't breathe out. So they have a little foot thing there and he'd push up to breathe out. And a little bit less each time. Because as the body is dying, the strength is waning, no ability to push up to get that air out. All people on the cross died this same way. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, one one ounce of strength gone out of him. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Surely, certainly, absolutely, definitely, this was the Son of God. No one else could have gone through the cross like Christ. No one else could have gone to the cross like Christ. Roman numeral 5 in your outline. Now we're coming back now to Daniel chapter 9. And it says that the covenant was confirmed with many. Now I want to start out this discussion with the last verse in this point. Mark 14 verse 24. This is a powerful, powerful verse. Mark 14 and verse 24. And he said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Not any, not every. The word many is written in a beautiful way in the Greek, which shows it literally means Shed for to whom it belongs. And that's exactly what it means. So when you read this, shed for the ones to whom it belongs. No one else. Christ did not shed his blood for anyone. He shed his blood for those his father sent him to save. Now with that, come back to Isaiah 55 this time. And verse 3. 
Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And you can see the last promise he gave to David, called the sure mercies of David, that he will save his elect. David being, if you will, in the scriptures, the head of that family, he says, I will save all of your family. David said, I haven't seen it. Well, of course not. You and I hadn't been born yet. But he knew it was so. He saw it, as it says in another place in the scripture, as in a figure. Look at Psalm now, chapter 89. And verse 34. My covenant will I not break. Now you go earlier in Psalm 89, and you see that he made this covenant with David, which is a type of Christ. Let me have your attention. He made this covenant about the elect, but he made this covenant with his son. Nobody can violate it. The Father made it, the Son in his death finished it, ratified it, and made it eternally so. Look at Isaiah chapter 54 now. I start reading in verse 7. I preached this about three or four months ago. For the small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. This is as the waters of Noah. For as I have sworn the waters of Noah go no more, more over all the earth, I have sworn I won't be wroth with you forever, nor rebuke you. Forever. Verse 10. The mountains will depart. The hills be removed. But his kindness will never be removed from you. Never. Never, never, never. Throughout eternity, his kindness shall never, never be removed from you. Back to Daniel chapter 9. Point 5 in your outline. The covenant was confirmed with many. I've discussed that. But in the process I want you to look at verse 27. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Christ once offered himself sacrifice, no other sacrifice ever. That's the only sacrifice. And all of the oblations that they did in the Old Testament ceased. No more of that nonsense anymore. We worship Christ, not by our works. So in conclusion, this annihilates pride and self-credit, and it sure ought to, and gives glory to Christ Jesus alone. That'll help you.